Wendy Hartsock, science and peptide enthusiast. In this episode of Exploration Science, Dr. David Schultz, the Chief Operating Officer and Co-Founder of Minode Bio, discusses next-generation diagnostics based on de novo protein biosensors. Well, um, tell me a little bit about what Minod does, and then we can kind of dive into some of the technology. Absolutely. So, um, so Minode Bio is named uh, after um, a very famous uh, biochemist who, who shares the same last name and, and won the, the Nobel Prize uh, in 1967. He was sort of a swashbuckling uh, figure from, you know, the yesteryears of science. Um, he fought in the French resistance during World War II. Um, he was uh, supposedly quite, you know, handsome and debonair. He spoke, although he was French, he spoke English without uh, a French accent because his mother was actually American. Um, you know, if you, if you look up pictures of Jacques Monod, he's unfailingly smoking a cigarette, including while he's in the lab. And uh, of course, he's, you know, was responsible for some uh, seminal uh, discoveries. Uh, and, and one of those is really the allosteric effect, um, which is key for, for our technology, which is why we, we named the company Minode Bio in, um, in homage to, uh, to, you know, this, this biochemist from, uh, from yesteryear who's whose discoveries and, you know, uh, the effects, the effects that he described we're still using, uh, using today. So Minode Bio is a spin out company from the University of Washington IPD and the lab of Dr. David Baker. And I think we're probably the 14th or 15th company that has spun out of the IPD amazingly, probably over the past 10 or 12 years. We are the first company that's focused on diagnostics. There have been other companies that have come out of the IPD focused on vaccines like Icosavax or cancer therapeutics like neoleukin therapeutics or, you know, others um, that are focused in other areas where there's a platform, cell, cellular technologies, um, companies like Sana, uh, Lyell, um, Outpace Bio, A Alpha Bio, but we're really the first company that is focused on translating biosensors either into new uh, tools for biotech or into new clinical diagnostics. And so that's really the, the focus of Minode Bio is taking this amazing technology that was in part invented by our chief scientific officer, Alfredo, and creating um, next generation clinical diagnostics uh, you know, from, from this uh, platform technology. And it looks like you're really sort of um, gearing these towards point of care diagnostics. Is that, is that we correct? we are? We really we are very interested in the point of care as being sort of the center of the target uh, for us. And there's a number of reasons. You know, as we have all seen, you know, during the COVID nineteen pandemic, uh, for better or for worse, um, we're there's also a really interesting opportunity to go beyond the point of care and to think about, you know, tests that can be done in the home environment or, or more of a remote environment beyond just the typical point of care. And there's, of course, a lot of needs still for new tests that would be done in more of a central laboratory or core lab environment. And we're very interested in, you know, opportunities in both of those spaces. But we really see those as adjacencies and, and think that starting in the point of care where, you know, point of care is really a spectrum that could be everything from the emergency department, perhaps when a patient is coming in and, and they're, you know, today in a, in a busy emergency department, even in an urban area, you know, the number of point of care tests that people are typically running, whether they're nurses or doctors or respiratory therapists, is very small. It's typically things like an EKG, a test for lactate, maybe a test for uh, glucose or, or blood gas, urinalysis. But when we think about the ability to have a, you know, a device that could have a small footprint that would really expand what people could do in the emergency department setting, I mean, that's certainly a very interesting use case. But we also are thinking about, you know, point of care as being urgent care centers, you know, perhaps as we've seen with 
groups like CVS or Walgreens, you know, really leveraging their brick and mortar environment to be able to do more for patients in communities, whether that's immunization or uh, childhood, you know, vaccines or or well child checks or or even other aspects of primary care. And then we're also thinking about, you know, use cases in the primary care environment or maybe the specialty care environment, a pediatrician, an internal medicine physician, maybe a nurse practitioner. Um, one of our product development advisory board members is an expert in practicing endocrinologist. And we've had a lot of interesting conversations with her about, you know, the workflow for the practicing endocrinologist and, and really the burden that's placed on both the patients and the providers. So as we think about a test where you could imagine a patient coming in and having maybe a, a thyroid stimulating hormone and a free T4 level drawn in the office during the course of the visit, that would save the patient having to wait, perhaps have their medications you know adjusted later in the week by the physician. It would save the physician having to get labs back from the central lab two days later, updating the electronic medical record. So we're really thinking about point of care very broadly. And we think we're going to learn a lot as we move forward with developing clinical diagnostics for the point of care that will allow us to continue to assess the opportunities in some of those adjacent areas. Yeah. And so you sort of mentioned that this is um, a technology, a platform that has um, applications in many, many areas, and mm -hmm. it's a modular platform. So maybe could you describe the actual platform itself? Sure, absolutely. So the, the platform, again, which came out of the University of Washington IPD, is a very modular platform full stop. So, you know, we are really leveraging aspects of its modularity for um, application in diagnostics, but other people have used this fundamental locker platform, uh, as we call it, for application in, in different areas. That could be in uh, conditionally activated therapeutics. It could be in uh, cellular therapies. Again, our focus and, and really the scope of our intellectual property is all around all around diagnostics. But in in essence, what what this system looks like <clears throat> is it's a two protein uh, system where the the proteins have a what we call a cage protein that I'll talk more about and a key protein. And the cage, both of these are quite small. The cage protein is about 50 kilodaltons. You know, your typical antibody is probably more on the order of 150 kilodaltons. And the key is about half that size, about 25 or, or 27 kilodaltons. And basically the, the cage, if we think of it as kind of a U-shaped uh, confirmation when it's in its closed state, and the key is, is really kind of a linear construct. And and the, at the end of the key is a um, split luciferase uh, component and buried inside of the U shape for the, the cage is the other half of that split luciferase. And basically what the system does is when the cage um, is in its closed state, again, kind of think of it as looking like a, a U shape and we have the linear key, and when the cage encounters the amyloid of interest, let's say something like cardiac troponin I is a wonderful example, the thermodynamic metastability of the, of the cage is disturbed by the binding energy associated with the, with the amyloid. And so it actually opens up to more of an L shape. And in doing so, and again, this is all just under thermodynamic control, it admits the key and then reconstitutes the split luciferase. And so you actually get, of course, as we all know, you get a, you know, a nice production of light with this uh, split luciferase uh, coming back together to now be you know, reconstituted. And because of the nature of the, of the proteins and the, th the fact that they're under thermodynamic control, the whole reaction is also reversible. And, um, but it's also cumulative. And so you actually, in a way, have a full biosensor within, uh, you know, one step and, and, and just two molecule or two proteins of, of the same system. So you have, you know, you have, in, in essence, detection, transduction and reporting all in, in one step. 
and it's reversible. And as we'll talk perhaps more about, it's very modular and it's very tunable as well. So um, while it's sensitive and specific, you can actually tune that sensitivity and specific within a dynamic range. And something else that I noticed when I was looking through some of those materials was that, um, so for example, you mentioned the SARS-CoV-2, uh -huh. You not only detect antibodies, but you can detect neutralizing antibodies. Um, yeah, and that exactly. has to do with what you put onto the cage system. So maybe, yeah, I mean, I guess that leads us into the modularity as well at the, the platform. Yeah. I mean, you know, one of the, the really interesting applications, just to, to talk about that for a little while, yeah. um, was uh, reported in a, in a paper that came out in the middle of last year uh, that was published by one of our collaborators and actually um, one of our uh, scientific co-founders, uh, Jason Zhang and our, and our CSO Alfredo and, and David Baker. And it really showed that you could use these same, you know, thermodynamically coupled biosensors to not only directly detect um, in, the, in the scheme that I mentioned, where you start in a closed state, and then when you detect the analyte, you actually have the open state for the cage pro protein. But you could also do the reverse, where you can actually start in an open state. And then uh, based on you know, interference, you can actually leverage the reverse of the process. And in that, in that paper, what they showed was that you can actually then detect not just antibodies and not just the receptor binding domain for the SARS-CoV-2 virus, but you can also detect neutralizing antibodies. And, and what they were able to show in that paper, I think they studied four different types of, uh, or variants of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, and were able to show that you could detect neutralizing antibodies to all four of those. And of course, as you know, that paper was published in the, let's say in, in April or May of 2022. And as we all know, you know, we've continued to see uh, you know, new variants arise in different geographies. And so one of the things that they talk about in that paper is the fact that the, the methodology is very amenable to continuing to detect neutralizing antibodies for, for, different, uh, for different types of variants. And of course, you know, we're able to test for uh, antigen uh, at home easily. And, and in some cases, um, you know, even with amplified methods, but uh, testing for antibodies and for neutralizing antibodies is something that typically is outside of what can be done in the home setting, outside of what can be done in the point of care setting. And if we think about uh, how useful it would have been earlier in the pandemic to be able to detect neutralizing antibodies and, and not just the qualitative presence or absence thereof, but actually really a quantitative or at least semi-quantitative measuring of them, you know, I think that would have been a really nice tool to have for, you know, managing aspects of the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic. Yeah, absolutely. So then, yeah, maybe just talk a little bit more, I guess, like I, you, you even mentioned yeah. there's like so many applications that you're looking at, including in cardiac disease and yes. ecology. So yes. maybe talk about that a little. Well, so as you mentioned earlier, you know, it's a highly modular technology. And, you know, I honestly feel like we are just at the beginning of a seven or 10 year journey to really fully exploit the power of the, of the platform. And I, I feel like we're starting with version one of the platform. And, you know, as if it was a, you know, as if it was a software, I like the idea that every 18 months, we're going to come up with the next version of the platform. So right now, you know, the platform is exquisitely um, valuable for detecting proteins and reporting with luminescence and certainly multiplexing. So the detection and reporting on, you know, multiple analytes simultaneously is very much in scope for us. As we go forward in the future, we kind of think of it as a, you know, a, as a matrix where we would like to be able to expand the range of what we can detect and then also expand the range of how we can report on these because there's a number of different use cases. So if we think about expanding our, you know, what our range of what we can detect in terms of analytes right now, as I mentioned, you know, we're, we're very good at detecting proteins in many ways. That's what the system that Alfredo developed was really uh, geared towards, but there's a lot of use cases where we would like to detect lipids and sugars. 
Um, I think that small molecules uh, is another very exciting area that we're doing some preliminary work on. And then as we think about, you know, kind of reaching for the future, um, we have an interesting collaboration that we're just starting. It would be a multi-year effort to really address the question of could we actually be detecting nucleic acids, RNA and DNA with this system? And so there's a lot we can do with our current platform. And we're very focused on, you know, creating product candidates uh, from that platform and then using that as really, you know, our stepping stones to being able to have version two and version three of the of the platform as we go forward so that we can continue to populate this matrix. On the other side of the matrix, you know, thinking about um, how we can report right now, we use luminescence as our you know, primary you know, sort of report, reporting workhorse. But we know from work that Alfredo and others have done um, that we can do uh, fluorescent reporting, uh, certainly do things uh, incorporating technologies like BRET and, and FRET as well. We know um, from a, a paper that Alfredo published in Nature in, in January of uh, 2021, they demonstrated that they can do colorimetric or you know, a change in color type of reporting, which in certain settings could be you know, really very interesting and, and really help to, to drive that expansion from point of care to other settings. And then, you know, something that we really haven't done much work on yet, but that we're asked about all the time and might have certain, you know, applications is really electrochemical reporting as well. So the modularity and allowing us to really, you know, fill out the different quadrants of this, of this matrix is a big part of our, you know, plan again for the next, you know, seven to 10 years as we build the, as we build the company. And we're very, very fortunate to have investors who are very patient and who really see the potential for both the products and the platform and who are committed to that, you know, to that uh, long-term development uh, program. Nice. And something else I think that's so fascinating. So you have all these areas that you can target, like disease yeah. states yeah. and, well, and, and like you said, potentially chemicals and, yes. and whatnot. But you can use silk proteins to now take this platform into all kinds of, um, it's like like printed materials, right? So yes, exactly, exactly. And, and it was so really interesting, you know, the something that we talk about, well, every week, if not every day, is just how important it is as a early stage R&D venture capital backed company to be aware of all the opportunity, but to maintain a truly exquisite focus. And, you know, of course, 70% of our staff are engineers and scientists, and we're a naturally curious bunch, and there's lots of things that we could do. And a big focus for us, of course, is, is focus, is just really proving uh, that we can actually do what we've set out to do first, which is really oriented towards biotechnology and medicine and, and specifically clinical diagnostics. But, you know, in the in the ecosystem, and this is why academic collaborations are so powerful and interesting, are all these other applications. You could imagine applications to agriculture and food science and um, threat detection and, and national defense and, you know, all sorts of other interesting applications. And so, um, something fun that that you know has been brewing for a while but it was just published was a a paper by a woman named Luciana Domoni and Alfredo our CSO and then Fiorenzo Omanetto at, at Tufts where they are expert in using a very interesting matrix a, a silk matrix from the from the domesticated silkworm that they use to incorporate uh, you know with their own proprietary special sauce um, into all sorts of different, you know, uh, polymorphic biomaterials. And so they just published a paper and, you know, it's, it's just what you said. It's just, it's, there's just a lot of curiosity driven science there combined, combining their expertise with, with the biosensors where they've actually shown that they can do everything from, uh, just to name a few examples, testing for HER2 in, um, basically nipple secretions that would be captured in like a 
a pad that would be worn in, inside of a, of a woman's bra. Um, they've been able to put these um, biosensors in, in a silk matrix on the back of a, of a small drone that they've flown around and they've detected the SARS-CoV-2 in, in airborne particles. Um, they've been able to leverage one of Alfredo's biosensors, which is for one of the botulinum uh, toxins, to actually put it in top of a in the top of a lid that you know could be used for food storage and actually detect botulinum uh, toxin in the food. So, and they've also been able to put these into uh, wearable masks again using their silk matrix and even onto onto gloves that you know could be used by healthcare providers or others. And and what they've done in these early experiments is just basically to to leverage the luminescence properties. But of course, there's all sorts of other, you know, we could incorporate the modularity there. So while these aren't really the, you know, the focus of, of our efforts, um, I think that it's just emblematic of how valuable it is, even as a, as a, you know, R&D focused venture backed, you know, industry company to still be maintaining these types of collaborations and to allow academic labs to do much of what they do best, which is to really pursue the curiosity driven science. But it is really fun to see, you know, those papers come out and, and to be able to see things like a, a drone that has a, um, you know, a, a SARS-CoV-2 RBD detector, you know, baked into the, into the silk fabric. But we also have learned a lot through, through collaborations like this. So one of the things that was very interesting that came out of their work was that they did uh, they did uh, stability testing, uh, for example, in, in very you know warm if not hot environments, sixty degrees C for uh, for four months or room temperature for a year, and you know really showed uh, you know independently um, as part of their own efforts that these biosensors, especially when stabilized in a in a matrix like a self matrix are very stable and you know just as effective as biosensors after four months at, at 60 degrees C or after a, a year at room temperature. And so it's also an example of, you know, not only do we see the kind of the cool effects of the curiosity driven science, but we as a company also learn really valuable things about, you know, the stability of our proteins. Um, and, and how we might actually in the future, you know, leverage some sort of stabilizing, uh, you know, matrix, whether it's silk or otherwise for applications that we have in mind. Yeah, absolutely. I'm not going to lie. The drone, the drone example was my favorite. <laughs> oh, I, it, it totally, you know, it, it totally uh, caught uh, my attention yeah. uh, as well. And in fact, uh, Fiorenzo Omanetto is is coming to visit us here in Seattle from Tufts. And you remind me that I need to send him a note. And, you know, I know we're not going to be detecting RBD here in our offices or our lab, but I, I do really want him to bring the drone so we can really show our staff because I think it's, it is very eye-catching. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, um, so backing up a little bit, unless you wanted to continue on technology, I was just going to dive back into sort of the the um, Institute for Protein Design. Great. So I'm yeah. curious to know, you know, so it's a couple of questions. One is as companies, you know, come out of it and get to the space where you are, how much do you interact with the IPD? And then yeah. also maybe just talk about, like you, you've mentioned a lot of companies, but sort of how that process works. It's really interesting that you asked that question, and, and I'll start with, you know, just talking about the IPD and, and our relationship. You know, it, it's very, it's very interesting to me. I was, I was just at the JP Morgan healthcare meetings where there's, of course, a lot of very large publicly traded companies. Um, but, you know, the, the streets of San Francisco are, are populated by lots of me, you know, people at small venture backed companies who are, uh, may not be thinking about raising money today, but are certainly thinking about raising money tomorrow and in a way are always thinking about, you know, raising money. And, and um, you know, what you hear a lot about in that context is, uh, you know, I did this or we did that. And, you know, there's a, a real kind of narrow focus on, um, you know, how one gets to the point of having a venture back company, perhaps eventually a publicly traded company or an acquisition or what have you. 
And in our case, you know, as I think back to November of 2021, when we launched the company and, and the months that led up to that, the IPD was just an essential part of that story. And it, it was everything from Dr. David Baker's generosity with ideas. Uh, he also has uh, a longtime colleague, Lance Stewart, uh, who works with him, who really functions as the chief operating officer, chief strategy officer, and has been involved in, in helping multiple companies to, you know, to successfully spin out of the IPD. Um, it, they have a, a, a very um, uh, long uh, established advisory board. You know, we benefited from members of that advisory board giving us their, their business advice and insight, but also introducing us to potential investors as we you know, needed to raise a, a small friends and family round to get the company started. And in some cases, you know, members of those uh, of that advisory board even were, you know, uh, very generous investors in our in our first friends and family round at which we raised six million dollars shortly after after launching the company. And so we were really taking stock in, in November of all of that generosity and that effect of the IPD. And of course, you know, different universities have different policies and uh, different institutes, but I, I know that it's not only localized to University of Washington and the IPD, but in our case, you know, that was really the, in, in many ways, a big part of our story and, and their generative and, and generosity, you know, generous influence is something that we still feel today. So we, I remember that Alfredo and Daniel and I were, were sitting you know, we had some uh, offices at the University of Washington in an incubator space that they have, which is where we were for the first year. And it was just the three of us. We hadn't even hired, you know, any other employees yet. And we we really said, you know, we've benefited so much from the IPD. We really want to keep, we don't want an advisory relationship on paper. We want to stay close to David Baker and Lance and the other people there, including the next generation of entrepreneurs to come out of the Institute of Protein Design. So we, you know, we made that commitment, but then we needed to figure out how to operationalize that. So we've done a few things. Um, one is that Daniel, our CEO, continues to serve as a volunteer entrepreneur in residence at the IPD. So he's there a couple of days a week in the afternoons, typically. And that is really about, you know, of course, he has time to parlay with David and Lance and others, but his real focus is helping the next generation of, of entrepreneurial scientists actually find their way to spinning out companies. We also have a very talented uh, postdoctoral fellow. She just came from, from Cambridge, and uh, Elise Fisher is her name, and she's actually spending a day a week, uh, maybe a half day a week at the IPD as part of her postdoc fellowship. And then I think the other thing that we're really, you know, working to do is, is just keeping that advisory relationship open uh, with David and others from the IPD so that it's not just a, again, a paper advisory relationship, but that we really, you know, are going to, to them and, and asking questions and asking for advice and, and, being open to, you know, sort of the, the advice and the questions that we get in return. And I remember we, we had this habit of, of having lunch with David Baker every couple of months. We sit down for an hour and a half or so. And, you know, I think he's a unique figure. He's very busy. He's very successful. Of course, he seems like every time I turn around, he's winning another, another award and um, all very well deserved. But one of the hallmarks of, of David is that he's very generous with his time and he's very focused. When we meet with David, he's really, he wants to talk about Monod and he wants to talk about science that relates to what we're doing. You know, he's not somebody who's looking at his phone while he's talking with you. You never get the feeling that he's thinking about the next thing that he's going to do. And so I credit David really as an individual um, with being a part of why we've been able to maintain such a, such a successful 
um, relationship. And we were having lunch with him one time and he, he made a joke, which I, I know was just, you know, in jest, but I think that there was probably a little nugget of truth. And he said, you know, typically the founders of companies that, you know, that I've helped to spin up from the IBD, the reality is they want my advice about as much as my adult children want my advice. <laughs> and, and he said, you know, I think you guys are a little bit different in that regard. And I said, you know, we absolutely are. But, you know, having adult children of my own, I appreciate uh, what David was referring to. And um, so that the IPD continues to be, you know, a very important part of our story. Um, we have a number of our scientific staff who either did their PhDs or their postdoc uh, at, uh, at the IPD. And actually, we have a little, we, we moved into a, a lovely new space where we've got, you know, a ton of lab engineering and office space and a little bit more than we, than we need for the coming year. And so we're looking to actually um, sublease some of our space to another company and talking with two different companies that are just about to spin out of the, out of the IPD as a way that we can, again, you know, kind of help the next generation, have those people come here for maybe a year, share equipment, you know, maybe we can share, you know, a little bit of insights from our, you know, founding story as well. So maintaining that relationship over time is critically important to us. And we're very, very fortunate that, you know, people at the IPD like David Baker and, and Lance Stewart continue to, to be very generous with, uh, you know, with their time. And, and they seem to be as interested in, in maintaining, you know, that connection with us as we are with them. That is awesome. Yeah. I, I know what you're saying that there's a lot of universities that have these incubators and, and sort of support for companies, but it does seem like there's just something special about the support that David Baker gives and the, you know, the, the, the environment that he set up to, to have successful Company. Well, certainly. And, you know, they have this very interesting, I give them so much credit. And I know it was, you know, something that I think their advisory board contributed to. Um, it was certainly, you know, something that people like David and Neil King and Lance Stewart have been very, you know, much in favor of, I think, groups like the Washington Research Foundation have also been involved in helping to support these uh, folks. But they have this translational fellows program where, you know, when people are really at that point where their research is ready for translation to more of an industrial setting and where the the scientist you know has decided at least for the time that they're not going to pursue the academic uh you know track but they really want to pursue doing the company the ipd has a mechanism where these translational research fellows are really in essence kind of entrepreneurs and residents sometimes for six months, sometimes for more than, you know, more than a year. And of course, the IPD benefits because part of the arrangement uh, with the spin out company is that a certain number, a certain uh, percent of equity is, is typically donated by the company to, uh, to another uh, fund that uh, the IPD has established externally that I think is called the Breakthrough uh, Fund. I think that David Baker uh, several years ago donated some $3 million prize that he had won to this fund. And they used that as basically the, the seed money. And now other companies have, you know, basically contributed to this fund with their equity. If those companies are successful, then there's a, a way for the IPD and the University of Washington, you know, to continue to benefit. So, you know, there's, there's benefits in it for the IPD clearly. But I do still see it as more of this really sort of visionary and generous approach that David and Neil and Lance have to really, you know, not not only being permissive about um, scientists who train at the IPD going on to careers in industry, but really setting up a mechanism that basically, you know, allows the scientists if if going to an academia uh, academic position is really where you're headed. There's obviously lots of ways we can help you with that. But if you're going, if you're really, you know, focused more on, on translational and going to an industrial, um, you know, pathway, here's how we can help you with that. And I really think that that's quite unique. You know, I remember when I was finishing my PhD and, and in 1997, and I was interested in 
in getting into uh, more of an industry role, you know, that was not very common um, at that point in time coming out of uh, at least the lab that I was in at the Fred Hutch Hutchinson Cancer Research Center. It certainly wasn't very common for the Department of Epidemiology at the University of Washington at the time. And so, you know, creating that pathway was very much kind of a, a, a bespoke or a personal endeavor versus something where there was an enabling environment. And I think about, you know, when we think about why the IPD has been so successful with spinning out so many companies, I do think that the, the mindset and the philosophy and the openness, but also being willing to really help create that enabling environment has been, you know, a part of keeping this flywheel effect going and really having a pathway for for people to go and, and to give give it a try, whether it's as a you know first time chief scientific officer or whether it's as a first time you know CEO or or other roles. Right. So uh, one thing that you mentioned was that um, the node. I'll say it correctly this yeah. time. <laughs> we say it, it. It's very funny you say that. We we accept all pronunciations and we have all pronunciations even just within our office. We had, uh, we had a potential collaborator in the other day um, who was originally from France, and we actually asked him how he would, how he would say it. And he's like, oh, I never thought about that before. I suppose it is a French name. And then he pronounced it. And, uh, you know, it was nice to have, you know, at least one authoritative rendering of it. And it wasn't too far off how we all pronounce it. <laughs> uh, I was wondering, so you you mentioned that you had uh, started Minode in uh, November of 2021. So it's a yes. very, very new company, yes. being very successful in fundraising. Um, what What is the path from here? Like maybe over the next like few years, what are your sort of milestones that you want to hit? Well, it's very much, we just had our January board meeting. So I can tell you this topic is very top of mind for all of us. So we were able to raise... Uh, between late 2021 and, and the middle of last year, we were able to raise uh, $25 million. And um, that was both the, the magnitude was important for us. We consider that to be our, our seed round. So we'll still have a series A in our future. And the specific investors uh, that we have uh, you know, in that round were very important. And they included everything, again, from you know, sort of um, well-to-do supporters of the IPD, uh, who you know put in money, whether it was from a family office or some other fund, or just as individuals. So our you know our plans are to have two years of runway so that we can have the opportunity between now and and you know sometime between the middle of 2024 and the end of 2024 actually hit a number of really important milestones. And while you know we see so much potential with our platform. Our milestones are really oriented towards products, whether those are research use only products that are going to be developed as biotech tools or whether those are clinical diagnostics. And of course, the regulatory hurdles, the, you know, the hurdles that we have to clear before we market a, a biotech research tool are just much lower and completely different than those that we're talking about if we're developing, for instance, you know, a new clinical diagnostic test for cardiac troponin I for the diagnosis of heart attacks. So we're very product focused. Our milestones are really, uh, you know, I think going to be fulfilled by virtue of, of meeting those product, um, those product goals. And it's everything from developing a the hardware system, which, as with many diagnostic devices, consists of a of a reader, which is uh, you know, perhaps semi portable, not disposable, and a, a cartridge system that would be you know very inexpensive or at least inexpensive and very much disposable. So for the first test that we're thinking about, we're very much thinking about blood based tests, and we're thinking about um, you know application again in the point of care in particular in settings like urgent care uh, urgent care clinics or, uh, or emergency departments in particular. And the types of applications that we're thinking about in our pipeline you know, include things such as, as I already mentioned, you know, a, a clinical diagnostic test for cardiac troponin I, for example, that could be used for diagnosing heart attacks. 
And we're thinking about other things, both related to that cardiac application, as well as, you know, other, other therapeutic applications driven by needs. I think part of the reason for being so focused on, on products is that not only is there a commercial opportunity there, but there's an impact opportunity. And we have always, you know, since day one of, of founding the company, been very focused on not just, you know, curiosity driven science and building out this platform, but how can we actually meet existing needs in the market that are either being felt by clinicians or maybe felt by people who are working in, in research labs and very importantly are being experienced by, by patients. And so that's a big, you know, as we kind of map the market opportunity, we're looking at those areas where there are holes and gaps and where people aren't getting their particular needs met, whether they're providers or patients. And we're thinking about how we can plug products into those holes. Not only is it commercially you know, important, but I think it also is a process by which we learn a lot about both the market, but also about you know, the, the limits of our technology, how we want to be able to push those limits. But I will say that for a, a small team, you know, we're currently about 24 people, as I already mentioned, you know, very science and engineering driven. People have a people have a hunger to see the fundamental technology translated into something that they can point to and, and we can say together, we did that. Absent us, that would not exist. And so I was just talking uh, before I before I um, started talking with you, I was just talking with a nurse uh, in the Portland, Oregon area um, who works in the emergency, in emergency department setting. And we had a number of questions for her about you know, everything from workflow to meeting patient needs. And it was really interesting to think about, you know, how a future version of our clinical diagnostic could really um, address some of the, the pain points that they're having that relate to the, the workflow for the nurse or the physician, but also relate to the patient experience and potentially even, you know, have the opportunity to create efficiencies that can be, you know, cost savings for, you know, for a hospital system or for insurers. And I, I personally find those types of conversations very motivating. I would love to be at a point, you know, if we could fast forward a few years into the future where we could actually be really pointing to, hey, there's a device, there's a test that absent what the team at Mano Bio did wouldn't exist. And there's nurses and doctors and patients who day to day are benefiting from that, you know, from that. And again, absent what started at the IPD and what we've been able to bring to the market, um, you know, that would not be there. So we're, we're pretty focused on that. And um, we find those, those types of conversations to be really, to be really motivating. And I look forward again to, you know, being a few years in the future, we can, we can really point to products that have made it to the market, whether it's because we bring them directly or because we're working with a, a larger commercial partner. So you jumped the gun on me a little bit because I always like to ask people what are you sort of most hopeful for, but that's a fantastic answer. We are, you know, my my wife is a practicing pediatrician, and obviously, you know, the, the needs and the footprint and uh, the devices could have in a in a small pediatric you know office are different than than what the needs are in the emergency department, but. You know, she already has a, a laundry list. I've, I've definitely got a honeydew list, except it's not at home, it's at work. And it's, you know, it's motivated by, we don't have this point of care test, and this is the implication. And I would love to have this point of care test, because then I would be able to do this and that for my patients and their families. And so, you know, I look forward personally to being able to, you know, be at a point where we can really, um, you know, say not just that we have the potential, but that we have done something. And so you asked about milestones, and that's really our focus is over the next, you know, 18 to 24 months, really doing that, that actual translation and product development step and everything that comes with it. ISO requirements, quality systems, clinical tests, uh, you know, clinical trials, laboratory validation testing, all of the market research that we need to do. Um, and, you know, part of my role as the chief operating officer, I really feel is just, 
you know, shepherding all of these different uh, channels of work that we have to do, you know, as if they were kind of sheep so that we, you know, at the end of the day, we all get to where we need to go when we need to, you know, when we need to be there. And, um, and, you know, maintaining that, that vision for where are we going to be in three, four, seven years? And what do we have to do today to get there um, is, is a big part of, of my focus and my role. Is there anything I didn't ask you about that you wanted to talk about? <laughs> well, I think that, you know, you didn't ask about and, uh, you know, I'm thinking about it all the time is that, you know, especially as an infectious disease epidemiologist in many, I mean, people have, you know, sort of morbidly joked with me. Oh my gosh, the COVID-19 pandemic is what you were, you know, were born to do. It's what you trained for. And, you know, I, I think, yes, um, you know, it's sort of an, it's sort of an unhappy, uh, you know, sort of level of demand for, for people who have training in, in epidemiology and infectious diseases in particular. But I think that the real thing that we saw that was very motivating to us in setting up the company was, uh, we saw the potential during the pandemic, how much people can do at home, um, how much of a need there is, how poorly met that need was by our existing systems, whether we're thinking about diagnostics or therapeutics. You know, I, I, I think that vaccines is, has just been a bright light as has, you know, has have some of the diagnostics. But now as a, you know, as a company that's focused on delivering to the point of care, I think one thing that you didn't ask about, but that I'm thinking about all the time is, is really the market opportunity. And, you know, if we think about two years from now, my hope is that the COVID pand the COVID-19 pandemic is really going to have, you know, begun to fade into, into memory as something that happened instead of something that is still happening. But there's going to be this opportunity that you know companies still have. I think if we're nimble enough and, and if we communicate well enough about it to really build on some of the lessons that we learned during the, the COVID-19 pandemic about diagnostics in particular. And you know, so I think that, but that's not inevitable, it's not automatic, it's something that we really need to do because this, I think that the the you know, the alternative is that we just go back to doing things the way that we did before. And I don't think that's what any of us wants, but I do think that there's a real opportunity. And one of the areas of focus that we have is making the most of that opportunity because fundamentally as with many other companies in our space, while we're very focused on delivering, you know, new benefits to patients and providers, we're also really focused on this larger question of, is there an opportunity to truly be disrupted in our healthcare system so that we're actually able to deliver more to patients and providers, whether they are in an urban center or a rural area, whether they're at home or they're at a clinic, whether they have insurance or they don't have insurance. And so, you know, somewhere when we get together and, and you know, share big ideas with each other. I think somewhere I am very excited about this big opportunity and it's not just, it's obviously not just Monod Bio, but I'm really excited about where we have the potential to take healthcare and diagnostics in particular together over the next, you know, 10 or 20 years. And so as we, you know, pause occasionally to, to think big ideas, those are some of the big ideas that we're thinking. Very cool. I'm glad that I asked if I didn't ask anything. <laughs> thank right. you. Yeah, with that, uh, I guess I just thank you so much for your time. I learned quite a bit, like despite the fact that I did some reading before this, that was that was awesome. So thank you so much. Well, thank you, Wendy. I really enjoyed, you know, meeting you several months ago when you were in Seattle instead of Charlotte. And um, I so appreciate that you know, at that meeting where I gave a, a brief talk, you came up and were kind enough to ask me if I'd be willing to do a, a podcast with you. And of course, I instantly said, yes, I don't think I fully knew what I was getting into. And I have really enjoyed getting to know you and I look forward to staying in touch. 
Thank you for tuning in to this episode of Exploration Science. For additional details on the topic, please see the description box for links to articles and other resources. If you enjoyed the interview, please like, share, and subscribe. As always, we welcome your feedback and suggestions, which you can leave in the comments section. Thanks again for tuning in.